Hi, my name is Janet Awasa. I'm in the Department of Biochemistry at the University of Utah. And I've worked with a number of different researchers over the years to really visualize and communicate their data to broad audiences. So today, this is going to be the first in a three-part video series um, that will be taking you through visual communication and biology. In this video, and the last two videos, will really focus on using uh, animation tools to create molecular animations. So when we think about visualizations in biology, there are a number of different visualizations you might think about. Uh, so we use visualizations throughout research, from thinking of how to, to create experiments, how to design the experiments, to collecting data, to finally communicating our data. And um, I really, I think about visualizations into falling into a few different categories. So the first, of course, is images. Uh, so we use images all the time, from microscopy images uh, to fix, uh, fix cells, for example, in fluorescence, uh, as well as for live cell microscopy, looking at movies, for example, as an example of these types of images, where you're really looking at 2D or 3D spatial data. And of course, we also have structures, um, where we have structures of cryo-EM, or uh, crystallographically uh, derived uh, structures that we can look at. Um, again, really showing spatial information of cellular or molecular structures. So next we have data figures, and of course we're all quite familiar with this, with graphs and plots and things like that. And the goal here is really taking information that may not have any spatial values to them. It could be, um, it could be maybe just put in a, in a sort of a tabular form, um, but to really be able to see the patterns and to be able to see outliers, for example, it really helps to be able to put them in this visual form, in the forms of plots and graphs. And I'll be talking more about how to think about making data visualizations later in this talk. Next, we have model figures. Uh, so these types of figures are really where we have to get a little bit more artistic. Uh, we're trying to tell a story about a specific process um, and trying to convey our, our, our hypotheses in this visual form. Um, so this is a really great example of uh, an illustration that was created by Dyke Mullins uh, to show the leading edge of actin, the actin networks at the leading edge of a crawling cell. And so I'll be talking a lot more about how to think about these types of model figures and how to create them hopefully a little bit better maybe than, than you have been um, in this talk as well. So the last type of um, the visualization that I'm going to talk about is animation. Uh, so the last two videos of this series will really cover animation in great detail. This is an example of a three-part animation uh, that was used in a figure uh, for a paper that was describing escort 3 mediated fission. Um, so animation in general can be really great when you have both spatial, 3D spatial information as well as temporal information uh, to describe a specific process. And it also can be really great for comparing these different processes as shown in this particular um, example. So when do we use visualizations? As I mentioned before, visualizations are crucial at all parts of research. Um, when you're planning experiments, you might want to sketch out how you're going to set up an experiment, for example. Um, when you're collecting data, they might be come in the form of images. But also, when you're doing analysis, of course, you're probably making a lot of graphs and, and charts and things like that. So we're really focused today on thinking about how we communicate, how we use visualizations to communicate our results and our, our hypotheses and really share those with others. Um, so first, I wanted to talk about model figures and how to think about a, a process that allows you to really create a very effective model figure. So the first step, um, and this is the same kind of process that I do with my collaborators, is to really describe the process. So what is happening? Uh, where is it in the cell? How many proteins are there? Which proteins are there? I'm really trying to get into as much detail as possible, but also thinking about that figure legend. So maybe it's something that you write down. Preferably, it's not just something you're thinking about in your head, but you're actually sharing with others, maybe writing down and sharing that with others. Next, you really have to define your audience. 
Um, so depending on maybe the journal that you're submitting this to, it might have a broader audience. Depending on who this, this uh, illustration might get shown to, it might get shown to students, members of the public. So depending on your audience, you may have to consider what kind of background information you could, you could include in that illustration, as well as what context you might be able to provide. For example, is this molecular process occurring in what part of the cell is that occurring in? And what kind of part of the body? Um, would, that kind of information could all be included in a visual way. Um, so that's worth thinking about as well. So the next step is really, so at this point you've been really de describing the process, defining your audience, and now you're finally getting a chance to start drawing. Um, so I always think that it's best to start with a piece of paper and a pencil and just draw, draw that process, draw that, the first draft of your figure. Um, and then you might want to reiterate on that until you're, you're kind of happy to show it to someone else because that's the next step. Is to really, so the next step is to show this drawing to someone, preferably in that target audience that you're thinking about. Um, so not to someone just in your lab, not to some, an, another expert in the field, someone who really doesn't really know the process very well. Um, and the idea is to give, you, give them this drawing and not to tell them what it is, not to give them any sort of, you know, a legend or anything uh, like that. So without any additional information, um, give them that figure and ask them to, to basically look at it and interpret it. So you want them to tell you what they think it is, um, and you want to note where they may, might be struggling with different parts of the drawing. Do they understand what this representation means? Um, do they understand what the arrows are pointing at and what that means? Um, so you want them to kind of verbally talk you through what they think is happening. And then after that, you want to tell them what you are trying to convey, and then ask them for recommendations on how you might improve your illustration to better convey those ideas. So next, you refine your drawing. So you take your drawing and you take all of these recommendations, these different observations that you've made, and try to tra change your illustration so you can really streamline uh, this process of someone who's not from your field, um, allowing them to really interpret it quickly. Um, so, and then you reiterate. So you take your drawing, your revised drawing, and give it to another person um, in, in that target audience and ask them to, again, tell you what they think is happening. And ideally, you get to the point where you can really have a drawing that you can show someone outside of your field, um, and they understand without look, reading any legend, um, without you telling them anything, they can tell you what that figure is trying to show. And only after that is done um, do you take it into uh, illustration software and create the final version. So I wanted to create to tell you about some general recommendations for when you're thinking about model figures. The first is, is not to recycle, to start from a blank slate. Um, so I think it's, it's very common in our field um, in biology to really borrow figures a lot. You see somebody else's figure, they use it in a talk, and maybe you just kind of redraw it. Or maybe you just take it from them uh, and reuse it. In general, I think this isn't a great idea. Um, and this is because there are a lot of um, kind of problems with the, with the original drawing, the ri original illustration that you can perpetuate when you do something like this. Um, so for example, in this, exam this kind of set of images of HIV, which all look actually relatively similar, um, there's some problems. Uh, so for example, the envelope protein, the kind of the protein that's on the outside of the membrane, they're actually only considered to be five or six of them, uh, maybe up to ten. Um, and you can see that in, in a lot of electron micrographs of HIV. However, in these sets, you can see that it's really coding the entire thing, which is inaccurate. Um, and also, the way that the, the uh, genome, the RNA, is depicted is also kind of strangely compact and short. Um, and so these kinds of things get perpetuated when people are kind of looking at reference images that may not be the most accurate. So in general, I think uh, you, when you are using reference images, use your own data. Um, use images that you know to be accurate um, and, and really rely on those to start creating your illustration. And another problem with recycling is that often when you recycle uh, a figure, it's not going to tell your story as well as when you create one from scratch. So um, really, it's always a good idea to start from scratch if, whenever possible. All right, so another suggestion is to start drawing early and often. So what I've found working with a lot of collaborators is this process of taking an idea that may have been just bouncing around in your head, 
uh, for who knows how long. And then committing it to a piece of paper can be a really creative process, but it can also be a process that allows you to really crit criticize your own ideas in, a, in hopefully a very um, helpful way uh, for your research. Um, so in this example here, there's a series of illustrations where students were taught a, a particular subject. In this, in this case, it was how cyanide kills you. Um, and then asked to make a drawing that depicts um, this sort of the kind of the things that they learned to another student. So to be able to teach another student um, about this process. And so teachers evaluated these different drawings. Um, and th what they found was that it was really easy for the teachers to, to understand what the students didn't get, did get, and didn't get from looking very, just glancing through these illustrations. And that could help them change the way that they teach. Um, but for ourselves, it also, you know, when we take an idea and we put it on a piece of paper, we commit it to, a, to this idea to a piece of paper, you really get to see, start understanding where there may be holes in your hypothesis. It may allow you to even design experiments that can really kind of better describe some of those. Um, those problem areas. So again, uh, it's a great idea to start drawing early and often. Um, and so this, this project, if you're interested in learning about more, you can go to this website, Picturing to Learn. Another general recommendation is not to start with software. Um, so I think it can be general inclination when you're trying to draw a figure to just go into PowerPoint and start you know, making something. It's not a great idea. Um, you know, for, for example, in PowerPoint, if you start there, chances are very good. Your figure, all your proteins will look like ovals and squares. Um, and, you know, the arrows will all look exactly the same. Um, and, so, and that can be problematic. Um, so in general, no matter what you think your drawing skills are, I think it's a good idea to start with a piece of paper and a pencil. Um, this allows you to really be more creative and allows you to be more expressive um, and tell those ideas in a way that I think just starting with, with uh, software doesn't really enable you to do. So with, when you're starting with software, you're thinking more about you know, how you, how, what your limitations are with the software, what the software can let you do. And with a piece of paper and pencil, you're really free to do kind of whatever you want. And that's where you really want to start. Um, so really try to start with a piece of paper um, and a pencil whenever possible. So another general suggestion is to try to keep things simple. The point of the model figure is often to convey an idea as efficiently and as quickly as possible to broad audiences. Um, so it might be compelling to do some things where it looks a little bit more 3D and add gradients and patterns. Um, but this is often makes things harder for people to actually Read a paper, read a figure quickly. Um, so getting rid of those patterns, um, getting rid of those kinds of gradients, really allows people to to kind of visually understand um, an illustration much more quickly and efficiently um, than otherwise. And, and another problem with software in general is sometimes having these sorts of gradients and patterns can be a default. Um, so it's another reason why starting with a piece of paper and a pencil um, can be a great idea. So another general suggestion is that you want to be able to guide uh, your viewer very easily through a figure, especially if it's a multi-component uh, type of figure where you have a lot of different parts and you're trying to lead people through it visually. Um, so the most common way we do this is using arrows. Um, and you can be smart about the way you use arrows. So in these two examples, you have one where you're using just kind of a straight arrow and kind of a relatively large arrow head. Um, and this is the same diagram here where different elements have been moved around and um, you know, the shape of the arrows uh, has been curved, the arrowhead has been made smaller, and you can see the, the flow of this type of figure, um, where your eye is supposed to go from one place to another a lot more clearly um, than you can in the previous. So just thinking about how you can really make the eye flow from one to another is, is a great thing to do. And again, this is something that would probably come out when you're giving your figure to other people to take a look at. If they're you know, looking at things in the wrong order, then you know you have to provide a better flow to that diagram. Another way to provide better flow is by thinking about where you place text. So by aligning your text to the way that your, your diagram flows um, can often help the eye, the person, people's eyes kind of follow things in the right direction. So that's also something um, to think about it and to change if, if you think that um, you know, the placement of your text might be disrupting the flow. So those are some general recommendations to think about when you're creating model figures. Uh, and to recap, you know, kind of the most important points, 
start with a paper and pencil. Just, just go ahead and draw. Show them to other people, uh, especially in that target audience, and get their feedback um, and before you reiterate um, and go into the, the illustrator or whatever kind of vector drawing program. Um, so in general, I think, you know, illustration programs like Adobe Illustrator are made for professional illustrators. They can be quite difficult to learn. Uh, but luckily, there are a lot of different types of um, tutorials and resources that you can find online, often for free, that you can allow you to basically take your skills that much farther. Um, so I often just like Google whatever I want to try to do in Illustrator, and usually I'll find a lot of different ways of doing whatever it is I want to do. Um, and there are a lot of uh, free resources you can find online. Um, so there are a lot of video tutorials that often are made by like the software manufacturers, by uh, people on YouTube. Um, Different places like that are places you can find um, different resources for learning um, software. And there are also more organized courses on places like lynda.com, uh, where you can have courses on things like Photoshop um, and Illustrator, even the 3D animation software. And it's always worth checking whether you know, these kinds of organized courses can be made, um, can be, you can get to them for free. So through your university, I can get through to lynda.com through uh, the Salt Lake City Public Library, if you're a member. Um, so those, those kinds of things are always worth looking at if you want to kind of um, increase your understanding of how to use this type of software. And the other thing I always recommend is it's also a great idea to just reach out to other people, maybe in your lab, on your floor. There's often someone there who knows how to use this software really well and is happy to show you or to even just help you create that illustration. Um, and you can also reach out to the art department if you're at a university. Um, there may be students there that you can just hire uh, to help you with this. So in general, that's the best recommendation is, is to take your drawing and really use a vector illustration program. Um, and there, there are several out there that you can consider. And using presentation software like um, like PowerPoint and Keynote can be used, but generally um, you're going to have more, uh, you're going to have a better, better kind of quality illustration, more expressive illustration if you use those other programs. All right, so next we're moving on to data figures. Uh, so data visualizations is a large, it's a large field, and we're really just going to be able to scratch the surface. Um, and, and I'm just going to be talking about some of the things that I think um, are, are kind of the, main recommendations of kind of the biggest problems that, that people see in biology data visualizations. So one of the things that I think a lot of data visualization experts recommend is really being careful with how we use color and using color specifically to represent quantitative data. And this is because the way we perceive color is really not on an absolute scale. It's on a relative scale. So we really perceive color and the value of color based on sort of the context and the other colors around it. So if you take a look at these two boxes, for example, um, on the top box in the blue, uh, it, the, color, the color that you see in the center there, that green shade, looks different from the, the lighter when it has a lighter green background. Um, but you can see that these two, these two colors in the center are actually, actually the same when you look at them side by side. And on the flip side, you have to, this, two, this example where you have two different colors um, that are represented in these two different backgrounds, uh, but they look to be the same value. Um, so it's just to say that we're really not very good at being able to assess uh, the value of a color um, when, it's, when it's presented on different backgrounds. And so in this example, we have a heat map that's often used to represent quantitative data, often things like upregulation and downregulation of genes. And we have here two different boxes um, with the stars in them that are actually the same color. But because of the way the, the background around them, they don't look to be the same color. So it's really hard uh, to interpret these types of of uh, illustrations, these types of figures, when using color. So in general, the, the recommendation is not to use color to represent qual quantitative data. So what do we use instead? Um, so what, what research has shown is that we're not great at being able to understand quantitative data using color. However, what we are really good at is being able to understand quantitative data when used on a fixed position on an axis using either length or position. So this last, um, this last example here is really very, it's very clear um, which of these, these I guess, five different points, 
which, is, which of them has the largest value and which is not. Versus if you take a look at the color over here, the volume or the area, it's really a lot less clear. So in general, um, using something like this, like a graph, is a much better way of, of representing quantitative data. So when is it that we use color? So color is really great when you're trying to distinguish different classes of data. So this could be on a bar chart to represent you know, different cells or something, or it could be on using spatial data. So for example, this map example, um, but also when you're thinking about spatial data in terms of, say, a multi-subunit kind of protein complex and trying to color the different subunits so that they are distinguishable from each other. So it's important to note that there is an upper limit to how many colors we can distinguish in general. Um, and choosing colors can be pretty important so that we can really see the differences between these different classes. Um, and the good news is that there are some great tools online to, to really enable us to choose colors wisely. Um, so this website called Color Brewer allows you to basically interactively select different palettes and some of these are you can use ones that ha all have the same color um, or different colors and, and also allows you to select colors that would be, for example, colorblind friendly. Um, and then you can export all of these color palettes um, and use them in your illustration. Another general recommendation, and probably one that you've heard before, is not to use 3D graphs and charts. Um, and so in this example, we have a pie chart that's both represented in 3D and 2D. And you can see in the 3D representation, the blue and the green wedges look to be about the same size. But when you look at them in 2D, it's very clear that the blue, the blue wedge is actually significantly larger. Um, so that can, be, that can be really difficult to parse and understand. And the same with bar graphs. When you have 3D representations, it's not clear, for example, which part of the, this 3D um, bar you're supposed to be looking at to, to look at that measurement. And in this example, the green and the blue, are they the same quantity? Are they, are they different? It's, it's really hard to interpret this. So the general recommendation is not to use a 3D representation if you're not representing 3D data, 3D spatial data. That's really, when you have 3D spatial data, that's the only time you should be using 3D. Um, so it's a great idea when you have a data set to take a look at different representations um, and try to figure out which representation allows, allows you to best see the patterns that you're expecting to see or that, that you, you're seeing. Um, and so, and, but you know, that can be difficult to do, um, to take your data and to throw it into lots of different graphs and charts it can be kind of time consuming. Um, but luckily, there are, there's software out there that allows you to do this. Um, and so in this example, I've, I'm using Tableau Public, which is a free resource that you can access, can download from online. Um, and you, you can import data and then visualize it in a lot of different ways. Um, so bars and, and graphs. And these are all, you know, you can just kind of drag and drop um, your data in different ways. Um, and so this is a great way to look at data, multi-dimensional data and different, um, using different representations and allows you to really kind of uh, test different ways of doing this. And then you can actually output the entire thing as an interactive um, that you can create online. Um, so I recommend taking, giving that a try. Um, yeah, so in general, um, those are some of the recommendations. But again, we're just scratching the surface. There's a huge body of, of knowledge out there. There's a huge body of work that talks about different ways of thinking about data visualizations. And I wanted to lead you to some resources if you're interested in learning about more. Um, so some of the figures I've shown you, actually a good number of them, come from the points of view articles that were written by Bang Wang and colleagues um, that really describe lots of different ways of thinking about data visualizations. These were published in Nature Methods from 2011 to 2013. And there are, over, there are about 40 of these articles. Um, there are also, if you're interested in thinking about how to do statistics and visualizations of those, you should take a look at the points of significance articles, uh, again, in Nature Methods. Um, and there are also a number of books uh, that you can take a look at. So I, I have a small selection of books on, in, on my bookshelf that I found to be very useful. And so these are those. This is just, again, scratching the surface. There are a lot out there that you can take a look at and learn from. And finally, there are a couple of meetings that I've attended that I found to be quite useful when thinking about visualization. Um, one is the Gordon Research Conference on Visualization in Science and Education, happens every other year. Um, and also VISB, uh, which also happens every year either in Europe or in the US. So if you're interested in learning, that kind of wraps up this 
particular video. But if you're interested in learning more about animation, I suggest that you watch the next two in the series that will really focus on that. Thank you.